This week on FRC Media News, Brian Bentley has been named the full-time superintendent at Diamond. The Bishop Connolly community says goodbye to over 50 years of memories. And we bring you more activities for kids this summer. All this and more coming up. It's Thursday, June 22nd, 2023. This is FRC Media News. I'm Keith Tebow. Earlier this spring, the school committee at Diamond Regional Vocational Technical High School removed the interim tag from Superintendent Director Brian Bentley and appointed him to the full-time position on a two-year contract. Mr. Bentley retired from Diamond as principal in 2014 and was brought back last summer as the interim superintendent following the resignation of Elvio Ferreira. The school committee broached the extension with Mr. Bentley earlier this spring and after discussing the proposal with his wife, Mr. Bentley was eager to stay on. My heart is here. Um, my being as an educator is here. Um, absolutely positively love what Diamond stands for. Absolutely positively love the students that come here. Um, it's generational as many of the students that are currently here. I had their moms, their dads, their aunts, their uncles. I am so excited to be here on a permanent basis. Uh, the interim tag is gone as superintendent director. We have exciting things going on with the school internally and of course we have the school building that's being built for the new diamond as we call it. So this is a very exciting time for me to be here in this building. Since being on the job since last summer, Mr. Bentley has been impressed at how far the school has advanced to meet the needs of its students. The technology in the shops is advanced beyond anything I could even have imagined when I retired, um, even in 2014 was when I stepped out here. In the last eight years, technology has really changed the way that the teachers teach in the shop. That, that's one. On the uh, student side of it, and the academic offering rather, the advanced placement courses, languages, the way that the students are, are taught by the teachers, um, team teaching is going on. Again, back then those would be considered new concepts. Now it's considered to be everyday, normal, the way that it's done. That was something for me to get used to. Um, just understanding how that works, why it works, uh, and how it helps the students. Equally as important, Mr. Bentley says, is ensuring staff receives the training it needs to teach the skills of the technical jobs of the future. The professional development for our teachers to make sure that they have the newest and best equipment in their shops and also that they're well trained on it, that's going to be a challenge to make sure we stay up with that. Again, this is the workforce of the future. They can't be using the tools of the trade that were so good back in 1976 and 1980. That's, we've gone way beyond that. We want to make sure they have the equipment they need to teach. We have the teachers who have the training to teach and the students who want to learn. That'll be the challenge. In his permanent role, Mr. Bentley will work in coordinating the construction of the new high school on Stonehaven Road. Groundbreaking is expected later this fall with completion in late 2026 or early 2027. Mr. Bentley is also looking at ways to retain students who enter as freshmen. One plan beginning this fall is to accept juniors looking to transfer to Diamond. We had more than ever uh, students as grade 10 and grade 11 wanting to come to Diamond. And it was a difficult fit because if you have been away from a technical, uh, technical career for two years, how can, you, how can you transition in and learn the same thing that other students have learned for a year and a half of being here as halfway through freshman year and sophomore year? On the uh, vocational instructors were very, very understanding. They said, if you give us the students as juniors, we know we can give them a skill set, maybe not the same exact skill set as the students who are with us, but we can get them to learn skills that will get them employed. And of course, that's what we're all about here. How can we train the next workforce out there? Those students looking to transfer will have limited options. 385 freshmen will enter Diamond. Okay, They are all mixed in among all the shops. 
as they advance to sophomore year, some change their mind, they transfer out, they move locations, they move out of the district. We can replace them because, so we can keep that same number. But now they've had two years of technical training. In the junior year, not so much. Again, juniors, students who are juniors, again, may transfer out, they leave the district, um, they want to go someplace else, which is fine, um, but that leaves an opening. Not all shops have openings in the junior year. Some are at capacity, others have openings. That's the group that we're focusing on. Where do we have an opening where that same number of 385 can fill those blanks? My goal would be if we take in 385 freshmen, we can graduate 385 seniors. Another issue facing Diamond and possibly other vocational schools across the Commonwealth will be changing its admissions policy to accept students via a lottery system. As most people know, you have to apply to Diamond and meet a criteria that's been established by our school committee in order to gain entrance into uh, the, the building, into, the, into our district. Um, and again, we have a finite number that we can take in. 385 is the number for the upcoming year. The lottery system would change that where the, uh, not, it wouldn't be so much as meeting a criteria, which would still be in place, but they would no longer have to go through the entire process. The lottery would mean if 700 students apply to Diamond and we can fit 385, uh, just think of all 700 applications being put into what I call the bingo barrel, where you roll the barrel, you reach in, and you keep going for the students till you get to 385. And those would be the students who would come to Diamond. So that, that's going to be an interest on how that plays out. Bishop Connolly High School will close for good later this month. Last Thursday evening, alumni and students were allowed to say one last goodbye. The event began with hundreds of supporters attending a massive Thanksgiving, followed by the opportunity to walk the halls of the 57-year-old high school. During Mass, school chaplain Father Riley Williams said even after the announcement was made of the school's closing, the learning at Connolly continued unabated. Lots of schools call themselves a community, but, and I've only had the privilege of being part of this community for one year as chaplain, but for Bishop Connolly, it was true. So many great memories and accomplishments, and it's been wonderful to see how even in the past year, even after the school was announced as closing, that your successors as Cougars didn't let up on the gas. Just over the last few months, for all the graduates who weren't aware, I want you to know that your debate team won yet another championship, one of many they've had. Our tennis team won the league championship. The baseball team made it to the playoffs. This year, almost 4,000 hours of Christian service were offered to our Fall River community by members of Bishop Connolly. And you know, perhaps most powerful, even on the last day of school last Friday, after the students were dismissed, none of them left. I mean, it's almost as though they didn't want it to be over. And about how many high schools, seriously, about how many high schools can you say that's the case? Father Williams went on to question the future of a Catholic high school education in Fall River. This evening we reflect not just on the closing of one high school, but on the ending of Catholic secondary education in Fall River. This is not just the ending of Bishop Connolly, but also of a tradition of which Monsignor Prevo, Bishop Gerard, Mount St. Mary's, Dominican Academy, Jesus Mary, and Sacred Heart Academy were all part. Now, of course, thankfully in our city, we still have five parish schools. And support for them is perhaps more important now than ever. Will we live the motto of this school, the motto over which you passed as you came into this auditorium this evening, to not simply be a hearer of the word, but also a doer? Will this be the end of Catholic high schools in the city of Fall River? You know, believe me, not only as chaplain here, but also as a pastor in this city, the need for it is greater than ever because the challenges faced by our young adults are greater than ever. We're continuing our look at some of the activities for kids this summer in Fall River. It's the third year of the Fall River Sports Network's Summer Basketball League held each Wednesday and Thursday beginning next week at Kennedy Park. We had kids from elementary to adults playing. Um, you know, we had 
over 260 kids come out last year. Um, it, was, it was a great time. Um, this year, I think it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, we reached out to a lot of community partners. Uh, we have some DJs. We have some giveaways. Um, we had a lot of backing from the city this year. Um, thank you to Mayor Coogan for um, helping out and uh, the, um, the city council for um, creating a youth initiative um, with a unlocked $2 million to go towards youth initiatives. Um, we happen to be um, one of the uh, programs that actually received that. Typically it starts at about 5.30, um, games to kick off at 6 o'clock where you have the elementary um, kids play and then the middle school kids usually play following the elementary school games. Um, and then Thursday leads into the, the uh, high school and adult games. Mr. Bailey says the league was formed during COVID as a way to engage youth by using sports to connect them with opportunities for success. During the height of those summer months, kids at night um, are looking for something to do, right? And then also reaching kids, um, serving as mentors um, without, you know, having the, uh, you know, just a traditional, you know, knock at someone's door, hey, your mentor's here, and there's no knock to those programs because they're great programs. But putting kids in a place where they can actually play, um, you know, summer, summer nights are a time where you see a lot of activity, keeping kids off the street, um, you know, having the ability to actually pull kids aside and having those discussions all summer where we don't get to engage with kids as much during um, the school year. And then also using the league, the block party, and some of the other initiatives that we do to actually hand kids off back to the schools. Um, and build those relationships. There are still a few openings left in the elementary division of the Basketball League. Registration is free, with more information available on the Fall River Sports Network's Facebook page, facebook.com slash frsportsnet. Youngsters who are stricken with type 1 diabetes have the opportunity to get the full summer camp experience at People Incorporated's Camp Jack. Named for former local insurance agency executive and community supporter Jack Rua, Camp Jack was established in conjunction with the Diabetes Association and is held over six weeks at Camp Welch in Asonet beginning on July 10th. Camp goes from ages, um, it, it will be going from ages 6 to age 14. Um, and the reason for that is that's the high, highest rate of diagnosis. Most kids are diagnosed somewhere in between ages three and eight, although we're seeing an uptick in older diagnosis recently. Um, but that's where kids get diagnosed. So it's the first time that they've ever come in contact or experience with um, anything related to changing their diets to keep themselves healthy and to um, giving themselves medication multiple times daily, not just a daily dose of medication. It's um, dealing with being in school and being the only kid identified as a type 1 diabetic and not having a cohort of kids that you can talk about it with, going down to the nurse to use the bathroom as often as they may need to throughout the day, um, and other kids not understanding it. Camp Jack runs Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and is staffed with three nurses to care for the needs of the campers. The camp caters to those with type 1 diabetes, but there are openings for others to participate. So kids that come to camp can bring their, peer, their siblings with them if, if necessary, um, but they can also choose a school friend so that when they're at, back in the school setting, they have somebody at school that they can talk to about diabetes who has learned about what they're going through and understands what they're going through. Um, so they understand why the bathroom trips happen maybe a little bit more often, why the medication has to happen and the blood sugar checks have to happen a couple times during the day at school as well. Um, so yeah, there are other kids that aren't type one who come in and when we invite them in, they, they have to live the type one lifestyle. So if they're engaged in an activity they're, they're really loving and it's time to do blood sugar checks, everybody stops, um, including those kids. So they understand that this is what it's like to live this lifestyle. It's not an easy thing and when you're excited and happy and doing something, that sometimes that moment needs a pause so that you can be able to keep yourself healthy. Campers are able to take part in activities that are found in traditional day camps. We have themed weeks. We get as goofy as possible. We have as much fun as possible. Um, for instance, week one this year is nature and farming. So we're going to start a garden in week one this year, and hopefully we'll get to see the fruits of our labor for some of our stuff by the end of the summer. I know it's going to take a little longer for other things. Um, but that's where we want to start, talking about nutrition and health, but being able to bring it into a fun environment for the kids, um, for their learning. We'll be out there. We'll be digging. They're, our kids get physical. Um, we'll be out there playing football. We have... Um, 
Splashtastic week, we usually, the Boys and Girls Club usually brings in a water slide for us to all share and um, we're able to participate in that activity. Uh, they swim every day, they have a swim time that they're allowed to swim. Most of our kids do swim, so break time for testing while they swim. Um, but all of our kids are super active. Basketball, volleyball, we have disc golf over at camp. Every amenity that's available to a regular Camp Welch Boys and Girls Club kid is available to our kids and our kids are encouraged to participate in absolutely everything. Much of the support of Camp Jack comes from local chapters of the Lions Club. 55 youngsters per week can register to attend Camp Jack. There are currently no slots available for the week of July 17th and the week of August 14th. Parents of children who have type 1 diabetes can still register for other current openings at Camp Jack by calling 508-206-0564. Discounts and other financial aid are available. Greater Fall River Recreation is once again back with a full slate of activities for kids this summer. We have our sailing program which will be starting um, the last week of June and will go straight through uh, August. Uh, we have five sessions so folks can definitely sign up for that right now uh, as well as our other programs. We have judo, we have basketball, arts and crafts, dance, uh, tennis, and um, comic arts. So they can go on our website and sign up um, on the website. It's gfrrec.org. Or they can come to our center at 45 Rock Street and sign up here. Other than the sailing program, which begins next week, most of the other programs will begin in July. Also beginning next week, the return of Recreation's free summer lunch program. June 28th to August 25th, from 11 to 3, we will be at seven parks and five housing developments. Uh, and there is going to be ver various lunch hours, um, 11.45, 12 noon, and 12.15. Kids 18 years and younger uh, will get a free lunch and they must eat it on site because uh, because there are no COVID uh, regulations anymore. Uh, we're going back to our old ways of eating on site. Um, and uh, we will also have various activities for the kids to do, um, uh, arts and crafts, games, all kinds of sporting equipment, play wiffle ball, basketball, throw the football around, or kickball, you, you name it, we'll have it there. We'll have more FRC Media News right after this. Here are some job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Kinder Care Teacher. Kinder Care Education, located at 620 North Main Street, is looking for a full time Kinder Care teacher responsible for creating a safe, nurturing environment where children can learn and play. Job number 192-37333. Parts Delivery Driver, O'Reilly Auto Parts, located at 171 Rhode Island Avenue, is seeking a part-time parts delivery driver to drive the company vehicle to deliver parts and products to customers and pick up customer returns. Job number 192-37184. Material Handler, Whirlpool Incorporated, located at 88 Current Road, is looking for a full-time material handler to maintain inventory by identifying, labeling, and placing materials and supplies in stock. Job number 192-37670. Receptionist, Health First Family Care Center, located at 387 Quarry Street, is looking for a part-time receptionist. For more information, call 508-679-8111. The Fall River Public School Department, located at 417 Rock Street, has an immediate need for the following full and part-time positions. Biology Teacher, Job Number 192-38610. Paraprofessional, Job Number 192-38754. For more information about these and other positions, visit Mass Hire Job Quest at jobquest.dcs.eol.mass.gov or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. Welcome back. 
There is less than one week left for city residents interested in running for office in Fall River to obtain and return nomination papers. Here's an update now on the ones who have done so thus far in the race for mayor, city council and school committee. In the race for mayor, incumbent Paul Coogan and former mayor Sam Sutter have secured papers. 2021 candidate Michael Vandal has returned his papers and has qualified for the ballot. Also taking out papers are Jordan James Sylvia and Gabriel Amaral. For the city council, eight incumbents have taken out papers. Linda Pereira, Brad Kilby, Andrew Raposo, Michelle Dion, Joe Camara, Laura Washington, Pam LaLiberty, and Sean Kadeem. Councilor Leo Pelletier has announced he will not seek re-election. Also seeking signatures are former Councilor Cliff Ponte, current school committee member and former Councilor Paul Hart, former Councilor and State Representative David Sullivan, Bob Pearson, Jordan James Sylvia, Gabriel Amaral, Gloria Sadler, Joseph Salvador, Ricky Tiff, Paulo Amaral, Joshua Texera, and Alexander Silva. The five remaining incumbents have taken out papers for school committee, Shelley Pereira, Sarah Rodericks, Bobby Bailey, Mimi Larravee, and Kevin Aguiar. Potential challengers include Colin Dias, Charles Chase, Warren Owls, Rena Brown, and former school committee member Tom Corey. The deadline to obtain nomination papers is this Monday, June 26th, with their return due next Wednesday, June 28th. Fall River saw another drop in its unemployment rate last month. The city's jobless rate in May sits at 3.5 percent, down from 4.3 percent in April. The rate for May last year was 5.6 percent. Rates were down in Fall River's suburbs as well as other local gateway cities. The state's unemployment rate in May also fell to 2.8 percent. Both Fall River and the state rates are below the national rate of 3.7 percent. The third iteration of weekly summer concerts in city parks will return early next month. Summer Evenings in the Park is a free event with music, food and activities for kids that will take place Wednesday evenings at eight city parks beginning on July 5th. The musical performances are being organized by the Narrows Center for the Arts. Executive Director Patrick Norton says the idea for the series arose around holding an event in the Corky Row neighborhood following a violent crime three years ago. This is our third year in a row that we've done the summer evenings in the park. And this event started um, really with a chance meeting with Paul at Barcelo's Bakery on Bedford Street about three years ago. And that conversation took place after there was an incident here at Griffin Park. We were trying to think of a way that we could kind of enliven and connect people in neighborhoods. And we concocted this idea. We weren't sure it was going to work, but it's worked. Support for the summer series is being provided by the City of Fall River, Viva Fall River, the Fall River Arts and Culture Coalition, Greater Fall River Recreation, and the Mass Cultural Council. Bristol County Savings Bank is again serving as a title sponsor for its donation to the series. This initiative featuring free, quality, family-centric entertainment brought directly right here into the neighborhoods of Fall River was such a success last year that we absolutely knew we had to come back and support this encore performance. We're always looking ways to work together with the city, uh, schools, and uh, nonprofits like the Narrows uh, to, to meet the growing needs of our population and to support the local economy. And what better way to bring people together than the arts? That's why we're so excited uh, this morning to be presenting this check for $10,000 uh, to help support summer evenings in the park. Uh, we hope that uh, with this support, uh, we can make Wednesday nights here in Fall River in July and August uh, a highlight for Fall River families throughout the community. The first concert will take place on Wednesday, July 5th, beginning at 5.30 p.m. at Griffin Park. We will wrap up this edition of FRC Media News right after this. Hi, welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. Today with us we have Tormund. He is about a year, maybe a year or two. Um, he's a great Pyrenees sh uh, shepherd mix. Um, he did come in us, into us as a stray. We have uh, quite a few restrictions for him. Um, you do need to be an experienced owner, especially for these large breeds. Um, they are tougher and they are strong. 
Um, with him, we are not housing him with kids uh, because of his size and we don't know his background history, so we do want to play it safe. You do have to own your own home for him. He does know pretty much the basic commands. He's very gentle too. Sit. Yes. Four. Yes, even when he gives you his big giant four, it's still very gentle. Up. There we go. So, I am short, I'm only 5'2", but he can still pretty much tower over me. But he's so sweet. <laughs> if you want to come down and uh, meet Tormund, you can give us a call to schedule an appointment to come meet him. Because I know Tormund would love to meet you. Today with us, we have a few ferrets. Um, in the shelter, we do have four total. Um, the two I'm holding right now are both of our males. Um, they these two came in as strays. These boys seem to be very affectionate. Just like any other ferret, when they get riled up, they will play nip. Ferrets are, meat, are strictly carnivores, so they have to, uh, they can only eat meat. They sleep generally most of the day. Um, they do need daily exercise, maybe to go out into a playpen, um, at least for an hour a day. And they're very, very flexible too, so if you do have them, you just wanna make sure your house is ferret proof because they can make themselves very flat. They are flexible. But yeah, if you want to come meet them, you can come make an appointment um, at Barbara Paws Animal Shelter. I know these guys would have a would love to meet you. <laughs> That's all for this edition of FRC Media News. Please visit our website at frmedia.org for all the latest news and local information. FRC Media News airs Thursdays at 6 p.m. and Fridays at 5.30 p.m. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next Thursday.